Hi everyone, in today's video we will be looking at the force of interest where it is a function of time. We've previously seen in my previous video where the force of interest was constant. If you haven't seen this video, have a look in the description below or at the link above. So we've previously seen when our force of interest is constant, we get to the following accumulation factors and discount factors. And these would help us to work out the present values or future values of payments. We now have a force of interest that is a function of time. When our force of interest was constant, we knew that over a given period, what force of interest would apply throughout. We now have a case where we have a function of time. And what this means is that we have a force of interest that applies differently depending on the time period. We now want to use this force of interest function to accumulate cash flows over time. So we need to derive an appropriate accumulation factor to do this. So we start by considering an amount AT at time T. And we know that this is the accumulated amount of our initial value of a zero, which we invested at time zero. So what this really means is that our AT is in fact our A zero plus some interest that we've earned along the way. We can see very quickly that we have an accumulation factor here, which is AT over A naught. And this is our accumulation factor as it applies from time zero to T. Now building on this example, we see that if we've got AT and AT eventually grows to AT plus one over the period from T to T plus one, and we are using an effective rate of I, then basically this means that our effective interest rate is equal to AT plus one minus what we started off with divided by AT. And we can show a quick example that if we ended up with 110 and started off with 100, then we know that our effective interest rate where the interest is paid at the end of the period is 10%. Now building on this, what we're really trying to do is we're looking at time periods that are really, really small. So if over our time period from T to T plus one, we are able to divide up our period into very, very, very small pieces, and we are able to zoom in and look at this very small time period from T to T plus H, for example, we can find what the interest that we earned over this very small period in a similar way. We do this by saying, as we've seen in the previous slide, we start off with what we end up with, less what we started off with. And this is effectively the interest that we earned over the very small period H. Now, what we want to do is we want to annualize this amount. And we do that by multiplying it by one over H. And if we had to just look at a quick example to explain this, we see that if we chose our time period to be one day in a 365 day year, then one over H becomes 365. So if this is the interest that we're earning over one day, then by multiplying it by 365, we have the interest that we've earned over the entire period or the entire year. So what we wanna do now is we want to take the limit as h tends to zero. This makes our period very, very, very small. And we know that this is our definition of our force of interest. By rewriting this differently, we will see that this bit is actually a derivative. And what this means is it collapses very nicely into a simple formula as follows. And now we have our force of interest function as a function of an accumulated value. But to tidy this up further, we can use the chain rule as follows. And by doing this, we have a function as follows. This means we have our force of interest function expressed in two different ways. Now we can use this to work out what our accumulation factor will be. So if we look at the case where we have a constant force of interest, we know that an accumulation of one at time t will simply be one plus i to the power t. This is our compound interest formula. Plugging this in, doing the maths, using the log power rule, we get 
to this function over here. And since our formula now does not have t in it, is no longer a function of t, and we're left with lin1 plus i. And this we've already seen in the previous video. If you haven't checked this out yet, please see the link above or in the description below. Now, when we get to the scenario where our force of interest function is a function of time, we need to integrate from time t1 to time t2. Looking at the function itself, we can see that it is a derivative of lin a t. And when we integrate, we ask ourselves the question, what is the antiderivative of our function? And in this case, it is simply lin a t. So we evaluate lin a t from time t1 to time t2. And following through the integration using the rules that we know, we can see that we end up with lin a t2 over a t1. We can then raise both sides by e to get rid of lin and we end up with this equation for our accumulation factor. We can see that this is an accumulation factor by noticing that we have a t2 over a t1 and we have seen this before. So more formally, when we have a variable force of interest function, we know that we simply integrate our function from times t1 to times t2 to get our accumulation function. And the important thing to note is that our force of interest function needs to be defined for the period that we're integrating. So given an example where we asked to derive an expression for uh, our accumulated amount at time t, we need to ensure that our force of interest function is defined over the same periods. In other words, we need to ensure that our force of interest function is defined over the same periods that we are trying to accumulate over. We are asked to derive an expression for a t, in other words, the accumulation of one at time t. In order to do this, we need to work out what our accumulation function is. Now, since our force of interest function is defined over two different periods, we need to ensure that our accumulation function is also defined over the same two different periods. We then first will integrate from time zero to t. And for the second period, we now need to integrate from time zero to 10 because at time t greater than 10, we've already covered the period from time 0 to 10. So that will be there, that, that'll be included in this new period. And then we also need to integrate from time 10 to time t. So this involves two different integrals or two different equations that are multiplied together. So it's important to understand the period that you're working over to ensure that you're using the right force of interest variables. Now we've spoken about the accumulation factor. Here we're working out the discount factor, which is simply the inverse of the accumulation factor. As a key takeaway, we know that the force of interest is a theoretical measure, but it's still useful to approximate interest that is paid very frequently. Typically, we'll be given a force of interest function that is defined over different time periods, and we need to make sure to manage this. We've seen what our accumulation factor is, and what our discount factor is. So it's important to use timelines when you do your calculations so that you're ensuring that you're using the right force of interest that is defined for the right period of time. It's very important to revise your rules of integration because this is one of the easiest ways to lose marks in these type of calculations. I've added a link to a integration cheat sheet which will help you revise all your rules of integrations. See the description below. And that brings us to an end. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're finding this useful, please share it with your friends and please subscribe to the channel.